Hi, everybody. Um, I didn't expect such a crowd tonight, but I'm glad everybody showed up. Um, I, I wanted to start this out by reading something here. And um, this was something that I wrote about Margaret um, right after she died, the day after she died. It was the obituary that was in the Sun News in Little Beach, South Carolina. Um, I had been working at the newspaper as a reporter for several years, and when I was in the hospital spending time with Margaret, it's funny because one day I just went, I just said, I've got to get things together for an obituary, for an article. Somebody's got to do this, and it's going to have to be me, you know, because I, I know I can get a, I know I can talk to them, and I know I can get an article in the paper, I know I can get a space. Um, I had just quit the job a month ago, I mean a, a month before then to move to California. So I went by there and I talked to the editor and they knew what I was going through. They knew I was spending a lot of time at the hospital and that I'd been caring for Marta for a long time and I had written an article about her two years before that that was in the paper. So it was all approved and I went around and I started, I got a photograph. I, I decided to use this photograph of Wynn Coates because he had um, passed away shortly before that. So I found that and um, then that night was when she passed away. So that, that was kind of interesting, nice the way that worked out. So the next day I already had everything done and uh, I just went in there and wrote it basically. So I'll read this. Um, and I brought a couple of extra copies, too, in case anybody wants to look at them afterwards. It says, uh, ballet instructor Margaret Kraft dies at 97. And this, there's this nice photo, I'm sure you can't see it, but from back there, but it's the one of, it's a really beautiful, soft photo of Margaret sitting on her porch, wrapped in a raftin, which is where she often sat on the screen porch in the back because she liked to be in the sun. And there was a bird feeder right there, and she loved the birds, and every day we filled it with um, bird seeds. We have that photo on sale, don't you? This one, okay. This was one of the softest photos, I think, of Margaret in her later days. It was really nice. The lighting and everything was beautiful. So what this will do is to give you a little bit of background about Margaret. It says, though Margaret Kraft of Myrtle Beach had a profound effect on ballet throughout the world, those people knew her say a bigger contribution she made to the world was the example she set for those who knew her. She was a living example of how life should be lived, said Edward Hinkle, a dancer with the New York Theater Ballet and a student of Kraft for 17 years. She was never late for class. She would stay after work and work with people. She made herself totally available. Kraft died Sunday night at Grand Strand General Hospital. She was 97. A Briarcliff Acres resident for four years, Kraft had a long and colorful dance career. She studied with Enrico Cicchetti, founder of the Cicchetti Method of Ballet in London in the early 1900s. She also taught for Cicchetti and later wrote two books about his teaching methods. He was about the best teacher that ever existed, Kraft once said. Kraft was uh, one of the first English dancers to appear with a Russian ballet group, the Oglev Ballet Rus, before World War II. Through the years, she taught some of the world's best dancers at the Sadler's Wells Ballet Company, later known as the Royal Ballet, the American Ballet Theater, the Metropolitan Opera Ballet School, the Juilliard School, and the Manhattan School of Dance. Also a natural storyteller, Kraft has written two books. The Dance of Love, and Still Dancing with Love. The books describe her early meetings with Mayor Baba in Europe, seven years spent living in India during World War II as his disciple, and later meetings with Baba in the United States. She was the director of the Mayor Baba Spiritual Center in Myrtle Beach. Tex Hightower, a student of Kraft for more than 20 years, and now director of the dance program at Adelphi University, said Kraft had a profound effect on his life. Miss Kraft was one of the best ballet teachers of the world. To study with her was a privilege beyond expression, he said. The vastness of her love for people and life itself 
is one of the greatest gifts she gave to her students. This was immersed in one of the most joyous wits and senses of humor that anyone could be blessed with encountering. Thank you. It was nice because um, the people that were quoted in the article happened to be there at the time because uh, they were visiting the center, so I was able to talk to them and to get those quotes, and it was, it was just really beautiful how it all fell into place um, at such a critical time. But the, the way, it's interesting how I even started working with Margaret. Um, I never thought that I would be doing anything like that. It wasn't something that I planned to do, you know. It was, in fact, uh, my next door neighbor, Barbara Zone, was working with her, and also Melinda was working with her. And, and I remember they'd come in, and I'd hear Barbara talk. We talked about Margaret a lot, because we would have tea together a lot in, in, on the Saturday mornings, and we would talk about what was going on. And I remember feeling, um, first of all, feeling like, boy, that sounds so hard. I don't think I could ever do that. I don't know if I'd ever want to do that. And then I remember feeling a little bit of jealousy, you know, that they were doing this and I wasn't. And, and um, I, I remember feeling like, this isn't fair. You know, I have to work two jobs just to make it here in Myrtle Beach. I work, you know, for 50, 40 to 50 hours as a reporter and work my tail off. Then I go and I have to work at the Hilton Hotel just to be able to pay my rent. And I don't have time to do anything like this. It just isn't fair. You know, they they have time. They have the wherewithal to be able to do this. So I was kind of like um, going through this phase. And I talked to Barbara about it at one point and said, you know, I think I'd really like to do this if anything were to open up for maybe an evening or a Sunday afternoon. I could fill in. And... Um, she said, okay, but it doesn't seem very likely because we have a pretty set crew here. I think there were about five or six regulars at the time. And she said, and uh, she said, but you know, if something opens up, we'll keep you in mind. But it didn't look very promising, so I just kind of said, okay, that's fine. Well, in about a week, one of the regulars decided that she needed, she couldn't work as much as she was working. She needed a night off. So there was a weekend night off. That meant one of my weekend nights would be taken up, you know, one of my only nights that I had. And uh, and the only time, it wasn't a Sunday afternoon or anything like that, the only time that was available was go in at 11 o'clock at night, spend the night, and come home at 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh so, you know, first I thought, I can't do this. It's too much. <laughs> no way. And then I just... I just went, yeah, I'll do it. It's like I just kind of gave it up, and something in me knew that I needed to do this, that it was something really good for me. So I made the decision to go ahead and do it, and even though I knew it would be hard, because Margaret was totally bedridden, and she needed help doing, you know, pretty much everything. So I just had to trust in that and go with it. So every Friday night, I would lo a lot of times, you know, work a full week, sometimes work a banquet on a Tuesday or Wednesday night, a lot of times work a banquet on a Friday night, you know, rush home from work, walk my dog, rush to the Hilton Hotel, work a banquet, get out of there, rush over there to be there by 11 so I could relieve whoever was there, or 10.30, and, you know, just like fall in the door, and <laughs> I would never, ever know what to expect at Margaret's house. And um, I don't think Margaret ever did learn my name. And every week I would um, remind, I'd come in and I'd go, remember it's me, Caroline. And she'd, she'd repeat my name a few times. And um, one night, a couple of nights, she really made it a point. Every time I'd come in, she'd say my name. And it was like really neat that she was doing that because she often made jokes about never remembering anybody's name. She could remember a lot of things, but she didn't remember names. And um, I would never, ever 
know what to expect at Margaret's house. And um, I don't think Margaret ever did learn my name. And every week I would um, remind, I'd come in and I'd go, remember it's me, Caroline. And she'd, she'd repeat my name a few times. And um, one night, a couple of nights, she really made it a point. Every time I'd come in, she'd say my name. And it was like really neat that she was doing that because she often made jokes about never remembering anybody's name. She could remember a lot of things, but she didn't remember names. And um, so that's how I got started there. And I just was sometimes saying, what am I doing? This is so nuts. I have the crazy schedule. But there I was um, in, at Happy House, staying on the center every Friday night, and um, you know, having these wild and crazy experiences with Margaret. <laughs> Basically, um, I like I said, I never knew what to expect. I'd get there, and sometimes she'd be asleep. She'd be fast asleep. Or sometimes whoever was there would be running around frantically. You know, um, Margaret's had a, had a restless day. She's not sleepy. Um, she wants you need to fix her some toast and she wants a story and so you know I just never know and um it's like it seems like the rougher my week was <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that um the more times Margaret would want to get up during the night and that could be anywhere from four to eight to ten times you know it just it there was no pattern to it she had just the most incredible energy level I've ever seen, especially for somebody as tiny as she was. Um, she, you know, she just, I don't know wh how she did it. We never knew when she slept. <laughs> um, I, I sometimes felt like the day people were like making sure she had really long naps. <laughs> <laughs> so. Then I would come and she'd be awake all night, but it was a it was a completely different experience being there at night than it was during the day, because during the day there were visitors, there were meals, there was um, a little housekeeping. Margaret would take a nap, she'd go out on the porch, and it, it was um, it was a, a lot. Different. I'm not saying it was easier; it was different. Being there at night was uh, just you and Margaret. You know that was it, and um, it was very intense at times, and it was also very sweet. And so I felt extremely privileged to be there at night uh, because it was so intimate. And to have that time with just her, but uh, it was, like I said, at times very difficult. Um, she could be very restless. and. Sometimes she was in a lot of pain because she suffered from arthritis. And um, I would sleep in the room right next to her. And, uh, you know, I, usually I'd go in and I'd change and put put on a, like a big t-shirt or big sweatpants or something because it was winter a lot of times it was cold. And um, Mar this is another thing. Margaret always saw me, always saw me looking my worst. And I don't, the only time she ever saw me dressed up or looking like I present myself to the world if I come over for a birthday party or something like that and then she'd look at me like who are you? <laughs> and uh, I'd say Margaret remember me I come in on Friday night and I'm the one that always wears the big Gumby t-shirt because that was her favorite t-shirt and it had this was huge and it had this big green Gumby on it with palm trees and a surfboard and, and um, she loved that t-shirt. I wore it one time and she would always like, I'd walk in and I'd turn on the light and her, she'd just go, her eyes would get real big and she'd say, she'd point at my t-shirt and she'd go, and who is that? <laughs> That's Mr. Gumby, Margaret. <laughs> and uh, she would just like look at the t-shirt and I'd point to the sun and I'd point to the and she wanted to know what the thing was he had under his arm and it explained to her that it was a surfboard and what surfing was and then she realized what surfing was so you know it was a lot of fun 
And I'd always try to wear real bright colors because she responds to them very well and uh, created a lot of fun there. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I would come in and um, I would start just try to talk. We would talk. And I would tell her about my week and the different stories that I was working on. And uh, some of the stories that I was wor working on were really sad, especially after the hurricane, when there were so many things happening with that. And I would tell her about the different things, and I would basically just tell her stories. You know, I'm, I'm writing a story about these people, and we'd go through that, and she would be just really interested in it. And so I might tell her two or three or four stories that I'd been working on that week at the newspaper. And then um, she'd ask me questions about it. So, you know, that was a lot of fun. And then sometimes uh, she, would, she, she was working on the manuscript for her new book with Anne at the time. And so she would ask me to get that out and read it. And I'd read a few stories of that. And she really liked listening to it. And then she'd stop and she'd say, well, what do you think about that part? Um, and one part in particular that she was really into was the um, the part, oh gosh, the story about um, Baba telling her that she was a blink, which is in the new book. And um, she told me, and, and I think there are parts of that story that she told me that may not be in there. Um, one part, with the part with the gypsy in there, in the new book, because that was a, like an early part of that story where she was telling me about uh, when she was a little girl traveling in Europe and there was a band of gypsies that, um, I think she was with her mother or something, they came up to her and they looked at her hands and they said, they looked at her like real surprised and they said, you're the link. And she always remembered that, but she never knew what that meant. And then later, Baba told her that she was his link. And then, you know, that all developed. It's like she tells it in the, in the book there. But I just thought that was a really interesting little part to that story that I don't think that it was written. I don't know if she wrote it or not, but anyway, I don't think it made it into the book. It was a, an interesting little thing there. And... Um, I have a, a journal excerpt here that I wrote that I thought I would read just to keep notes about some things. And then I'll just go on from here. This is written on January 27th, which was, I guess, about a month before she passed away. It wasn't that long now. She was going through a lot with her um, deteriorating state um, because she had a hard time, I think she had a hard time accepting that. She was used to being such a vital, um, independent person. And she always made, she always maintained her independence to the very end, you know. She was going to make sure that she maintained that. Whether she was bedridden or not, it didn't matter, you know. She, she would get up and she would walk around with that walker, even if it was in the middle of the night. It didn't matter. She, she wanted to walk, she'd, you know, bring me the walker and she'd, um, walk down the hall and back or whatever and get back in bed. But she just, and, or like, we, sometimes we have these little battles. We all did. We all had our little battles with Margaret. Like um, in the middle of the winter, it was freezing cold, and we're trying to keep a little happy house warm. You know, it's got like cracks everywhere, and because um, it was never really built to be a, a year-round residence, and we've got all all the heaters cranked up and a little heater right beside her bed to keep her warm. And she calls me in. You know, she always would ring the bell. She had a little bell by her bed. So she calls me in. And, points over and says, would you please open the window? Like, Margaret is it's like, it's below freezing outside. It's in the early 30s. And I don't care, I want the window open. So I go over and I like crack it. 
that much, <laughs> you know, and pretend like I was really opening it a lot. She, but she would know, and she'd say, more. <laughs> so I'd open it a little bit more, and I'd be like, oh, come on, Margaret. And then she'd say, now open that one. <laughs> so I'd go, all right. So I'd go over and I'd try to do the same thing, you know, I'd like. And these windows are, are the kind of windows that they they fit, and you have to, like, pull, and then, and then it would come up this far, and she goes, that's fine. <laughs> Sometimes I would just, I, she, she always knew how to push, you know, especially all of us, though. Every one of us would have to, she always knew how to push us to our limits. And I, I guess that was, that was a really great thing that she did, just constantly push me to my limits. And so I'd go in and I'd go, tonight I'm just going to be so patient. And anything Margaret wants, you know, she's been dead. And then something would happen. You never know what would happen. Like one night I remember, I'm sound asleep, and I hear this like something sound. And then it gets louder and louder, and I, and I, and I don't know what it is. You know, it's like a banging sound. So I think, well, and I'm right in the middle of my sleep, and I didn't get that many, you know, minutes of sleep while I was there. So I thought, well, maybe it'll stop, it'll go away. So it did, you know, it kind of like subsided and it went away. And Margaret didn't have her hearing aid in when she was asleep normally, so I thought, well, she won't hear this. So, you know, about 15 minutes later, it started again. You know, this like banging sound. So I figured out it was the heater in the hall. So I thought, okay, well, maybe I can fix this before Margaret wakes up. So I'm like, you know, getting a chair, climbing up to the heater, trying not to disturb Margaret, and the thing is just banging, and I had to pull the front off of it, and meanwhile, so here I am up on this chair, and Margaret kept ringing that bell as loud as she could, and I about jumped off the chair, and, and uh, I said, Margaret, it's okay, I'm fixing it. Well, she starts ringing the bell again, and, you know, and she keeps ringing it, so... I get off the chair and I come in the room and I say, Margaret, and talk, I have to talk real loud to her because she doesn't have her hearing aid in. How she heard this thing, I don't know. I say, Margaret, I'm, I'm standing on the chair and I'm fixing the heater. It's the heater, is banging. Just wait a minute. So I go up and I get back on the chair and she starts ringing the bell again. And, you know, I'm like exhausted anyway. So I just turned around and looked at her, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm fixing it. She looked at me and she said, you know, she put the bell down and she didn't ring it anymore. And um, I don't. I think what I had to do it was some oh, it was some kind of squeaking thing. You know, real irritating. I the, there was nothing in the house. There was no WD-40. Nothing. I had to get some corn oil. <laughs> I had to go to the kitchen to get some cooking oil and pour it up there. And then it started smelling like popcorn. <laughs> but it stopped squeaking. And so the next morning. I would, I'm like, we've got to get somebody in here. We've got to get this fixed. And uh, I think eventually I had to turn the thing off, you know. But that was just, you know, one of the little things that happens. That it's such a simple little thing, but uh, you know how Baba does things sometimes. It was very funny. Here's this uh, journal entry, January 27th. <clears throat> she calls me now instead of ringing her bell. Cooey. That's how she used to call me towards the end. She would, um, she said, Cooey. And that was when, when she started doing that was when she was too weak to ring the bell. She couldn't reach up and get it, so she had this little call. About 2 a.m. she called. Her arthritis was keeping her awake. I rubbed tiger balm and gently massaged it into her pale thin legs. And that's what we used to do when she would get her real bad arthritis. Um, it seemed like it, that was the only thing that would help the pain. We would come in and massage her legs and we would use Tiger Balm or we would use something. We were always trying new things. And her, her ankles were smaller around than my wrist. She was just tiny. And, you know, most of you know Margaret. Some of you may not. I talked to her about the newspaper and told her about some of the articles I'd written during the week. Then I asked her what she'd been thinking of all week. A lot, she said. There was a long pause, and I sensed that she had more to say. 
I waited. She painfully turned to her left side. How much more pain, she said. I knew that she was facing her own death and letting go of life. I felt so much love for her then. At 6, at 6 a.m. she called again. I saw the moon outside the window at the foot of her bed. It was full, hovering over the tops of the low shrub oak trees. The tips of the trees were gilded with the first rays of the sun. Margaret was touched by the quiet, intimate beauty there. Isn't it extraordinary, she said. I marvel that a woman, semi-bedridden for several years, could still be so moved by the same view that she saw out of her window every day. That was Margaret. No matter how much pain she was in or what she was going through or what was happening, she was right there. And, you know, she could look out the window and see that moon and that view and just be there, right there with it, no matter what was happening. But the beautiful thing was that I experienced it too. And I felt, you know, a lot of those feelings, I felt her love, her life. Because basically that's why she was here with us for so long, because she loved life so much. She was so vital. And um, everything was an experience for her, whatever it was. And her sense of humor was, and well, we all know about her sense of humor, how incredible that was. She could just say one thing and she'd be right there. She'd have it nailed, whatever it was. Um, really funny. Um, And I have a couple of other little things in here that I, I went through this journal and uh, tried to find some of the things that I'd written. I have another one too and I couldn't find that one, but one thing that I remember her telling me, she used to tell me sometimes about her childhood and I got such a kick out of it because she spent a lot of time one night telling me what a bad poet she was as a child and how she used to write these poems. And one poem that she wrote, I wish I could remember the whole thing, it's hilarious, but it was a poem about Napoleon. And it started out, the great Napoleon shivers as he paced upon the deck. And, uh, and the poem was about Napoleon wearing, being chained up on the deck as they were taking him to this island uh, before he was exiled. And she said, um, she said, my father had a fit. He said, Napoleon was never chained. And, and she used to really laugh about that, What just what it said her father had about that poem. It was so awful, and she was such an awful poet. And I got a, I got a laugh out of it. I remember one night, I told she never could remember my name. So one night she, she made up a little rhyme and she said, Caroline, will you be mine? Yes, on Thursday, if it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, she used to just say little things like this out of the blue and I would just crack up. It was so funny. But being there was interesting for me too because I, it was like walking in, I remember especially at Christmas, coming in to, to Happy House. Um, just the feeling that was there. First of all, the, the living room of the place was very cluttered with a lot of furniture, a couch and a chair and Margaret's wheelchair and the little table and the TV and always the fireplace stuff. And in the winter, Margaret had to have a fire. And um, luckily, the caretakers supplied us with lots of wood, and that fire had to be going if it was like the least bit chilly, or even in the summertime, sometimes at night, she wanted a fire. Um, 
But Christmas, I remember I would walk in and um, the mantel was always full of pictures of Baba and Mara and every tabletop in the room was full of framed pictures and it was really nice. And then there were pictures on the walls and a lot of pictures of Margaret and Baba and um, it's a lot of really nice old photographs. And then there was the Christmas lights that were like all over the mantel, all different colors. And um, it was, it, there was like a little tree, you know, Christmas cards everywhere, and it was just really nice. And sometimes when, when it was like that, certain nights especially, I would just, I would go and sleep on the couch in the living room because the, the atmosphere was so nice in there. Instead of going into the bedroom, I would just close that off, especially if it was real cold, and just leave the living room door open because I was just at the end of the hall and I could hear and um, and just the feeling of the place. And I just felt so fortunate to be there during that Christmas, the lights, the, the cars, the calls, and, to, and also to have it all to myself, you know, because I'd be there at night always. So that, that was really neat. Um, another thing I have written here, you probably know, but... Margaret's name that was given her by Baba was Zulika. Is that how it was pronounced? Zulika. What does that mean? Does anybody remember what that meant? I don't remember what that meant. Um, but but the thing about that house was that it, it was just interesting being there. And I I used to have dreams sometimes. I always uh, associated my grandmother with Margaret somehow, and I wasn't able to be with my grandmother, and she was old. I mean, she was, Margaret was 97, my grandmother was 87, so she was getting up there. And I used to always think about my grandmother whenever I went there and um, just ask that somehow some of what I was doing for Margaret be transferred to her. And um, that, that was just one of my wishes. And it was interesting because when I moved out here, um, on my way, which was, I left, I think, it's just a few days, maybe a week after Margaret passed away, um, I drove across country with my car packed full of stuff and my two dogs, and I just had this feeling that I had to go by my grandmother's, which was kind of a detour. So I went there and I spent two nights with her and um, really had a great time with her, talked and uh, talked about a lot of things that she and I had never talked about, like her death and um, the family and a lot of different things. And about two months after I moved out here, she passed away. And I think I was the only one in the family that got to see her, except for my father, who was her son. I was the only one that was able to see her before she died, so I felt like that was a gift that I had, you know, a blessing. Uh, just to have it come to me to, to do that. Um, I one night I, I dreamed that about Margaret when she and this dream in this dream Margaret was a lot younger and fitter and healthier and I just I didn't even remember it until I saw this note here. But I was in a swimming pool and she was in a swimming pool and we were just having a conversation. And then she started swimming, and I was trying to keep up with her, and I couldn't. So, you know, this was just one of the dreams I had that was kind of neat, you know, very vital. Margaret used to tell, tell me a lot of stories. Uh, she liked telling stories about Mara because she had such a close relationship with Mara, and Baba would ask her to do things with Mara, like he asked Margaret to instruct Mara how to swim. So she told, she would tell me these wonderful stories about Mara and just describe Mara's beauty. And she, I remember when she would tell me about Mara, she would say she was so beautiful. And then she would look at me very interesting. She would say, she, she had hair down to here. And she would always do this to show me what those waves look like. Because she'd always do her hands. And she said, she was extraordinary. She was more beautiful than anyone. She said, you would just look at Mara and just be spellbound because she was so beautiful. And evidently people were. Um, 
and I guess that's why Mara was so shy and why she was secluded a lot because she was just I, I don't know maybe that's one reason but Margaret would tell me the story about Baba asking her to teach Mara how to swim and um, because Mara was so modest she had to wear like a raincoat and galoshes and like all these clothes and so Margaret says, well, we got her in the pool, and I tried to, he, tried to teach her how to swim, and she sank like a stone. <laughs> so they had to come up with, with other uh, attire for Mara to wear, and finally they came up with th something for her to wear that was comfortable, and of course nobody could be around except just um, Margaret and some of the other women. And... She said that the, the extraordinary thing about Mara was that she was so concentrated, that she was so concentrated on Baba, that when Baba told her he wanted her to learn how to swim, she just shifted that, com that concentration. And she learned to swim just like that. And, she, and Margaret would always tell me she was a beautiful swimmer. And she, you know, she had a beautiful breaststroke and a beautiful backstroke and anything that Margaret would teach her to do, she would do to perfection. And, and uh, Margaret was just so impressed with Mara and loved her so much. And one of the, the things in, in the night when Margaret would wake up that she would always request was, um, or that she would often request was um, stories from the book about Mara, so I would read that to her. And she also liked to hear the uh, stories from the book about Bob and the animals. She liked those because, you know, Margaret was in charge of the animals at um, Marathon. And she used to tell me a lot of stories about the animals. Yeah. In fact, I've got one here that I really think is funny that she told me. If I can find it, it was so cute. I hope I can find it. Is it? Um... She would uh, take care of the rabbits and feed the dogs and feed the cats and the monkeys and, you know, everything. That was, that was her duty. But if I can't find it, I'll tell it to you anyway, but it kind of remind me of it. She said one morning, you know, they always would um, get together really early in the morning and they would say, um, maybe it's in here. They would say the name of God over and over again. And um, she said one morning she had a particular trying morning with the, uh, I can't find it, with the animals, feeding the animals. So she, she got in there, she hurried in, and she sat down, and they were all saying, the, you know, the names over and over again. And she was very agitated, and she said after about five minutes, she realized that she was sitting there over and over again saying the two rabbits' names over and over again. Sunny <laughs> and Bunny. Sunny and Bunny. Sunny and Bunny. And she just felt so bad. And so she, she told Baba that, you know, she apologized, and she told him that she'd been saying Sunny and Bunny over and over again. <laughs> so... She said Baba gave her a very stern look and then he burst in, into laughter, you know. So <laughs> she felt better about that. But she had some really funny stories about those animals. She loved them. Um, the thing about Margaret, um, Margaret, towards the end, we all knew that she was getting frail and she was getting, you know, we knew that it was getting near the end. I have been planning to move out to California for, I guess, a month or so. And the thought, it was, it was a very difficult decision for me because I felt inside that, it, that I needed to do this. It was something I needed to do. But everybody kept saying to me, what about Margaret? Are you going to leave her so close to the end? Because I had set dates. You know, I was going to leave by this time. And I just, I remember uh, Barbara and Melinda saying to me, you know, how can you do this? And I just looked at them and I said, it's all going to work out. I just know it. I have to make these plans right now. This is what I have to do. And I, it was like a part of me felt like a traitor. 
because I was planning to leave and I was packing up and I was selling things and and you know what if Margaret what if I left Margaret so close to the end? So it was very difficult for me, but I knew that I had to go by my feelings with that. So that's what I did. I just had to go with it, and I just kept closing things up, selling things, getting rid of things. Um, I knew I had to come out here. I didn't know why. I still don't know why yet, but I'm here. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> and I, I remember at one point saying to them, "Margaret's not going to be here when I leave." And um, it kept getting closer, and everybody's kind of wondering what was going to happen here, you know. So I remember one night, it's like we were all doing a 24-hour thing, pretty much, and there were usually two people with her at a time because it had gotten to the point where we needed more than one person there. And I went over there one night to fix dinner for the people who were there, and um, that was the night that Margaret had. I guess it was a seizure. I don't really know what it was, but I was in there cooking dinner, and I just remember hearing um, a loud sound from Margaret. And two people, Tex was in there, and Barbara was in there with her, and um, she was on the potty actually. And I heard this loud sound, and I went and I looked in the room, and she was slumped over. Well, I knew something was wrong. Her doctor was great. The doctor would come in, and she told us basically after about the second day, second or third day, that systems were shutting down one by one. You know, the organs. And um, so we, you know, we knew that that's what was happening. But and Margaret was, she was pretty much there, even though a lot of times she wasn't lucid, or I mean, she wasn't really aware. Of our presence, she would come in and out, and she was basically with us. But you know, even in the hospital, she was fighting. She didn't want that cord in her nose, and she didn't want, you know. And we we had to have two people by the bed all the time, just because she was trying to pull everything out, and she was strong. And so basically, what we would do is we would just like, you know, hold her hand and just try to keep her hands down by her side and not. Up here, and uh, <laughs> but I swear there was like a couple of times when she just about got those tubes out. I mean, you just look away for a second. <laughs> so it was it was an all night thing, all night and all day. And of course during the day there were a lot of people that were coming to the hospital that wanted to see her, and it was difficult because the doctor didn't want more than a few people in the room, and a lot of people wanted to be there and. Some people had known Marta for years, and they felt like they needed to be in the room with her, and it was, very, you know, a really difficult situation, as you can imagine. Um, so we just all did the best we could and tried to rotate and, you know, give everybody their opportunity to spend a little time in the room. And um, I, I was in the room with her for a couple of nights. Which was really nice, you know, just to be in there because it was such a feeling, such a um, such a, a, a rich feeling in that room. Um, Baba's presence was very strong, and um, I I just felt very fortunate to be there, to be able to be there through that. Although it was very difficult because of a lot of reasons. Um, I remember there was one point, and this this was like one of my biggest awarenesses with Margaret, because throughout all this, um, I had felt like I had felt like I was doing all this with Margaret. I knew I had a connection with Margaret, but I didn't know what it was. I didn't really feel that. I knew that that I was there, and I was there for her, and. It, and then it was for me, but I never really understood why I was there, what was happening, or any of that. And um, I used to just ask Baba to please help me with that, to help me to understand Margaret, to see her depth, and to understand a little bit more about what was happening. And I remember there was a point in the hospital where um, people were coming and going, and. 
there was there was a little friction because some people wanted to be with Margaret and they couldn't be and um, the, even with the people that were working there, it was like there was a feeling with some people that because they had known her longer or whatever that they had, you know, they should be able to spend more time with her, which was, you know, valid in a lot of ways. And I remember there was a point where I just, I looked at Dana, and D D Dana and I just like, we were in the hall and we were talking about these things and we were discussing this issue and I just all of a sudden just felt such love and such a feeling of depth and uh, just this this feeling of Margaret and I knew it's like I got it all of a sudden I knew that it didn't matter how much time anybody had been with her me any someone had been, who hadn't ever been with her at all I knew that none of that mattered, that the only thing that mattered was just that connection that we all have with Margaret, with each other, that that's really what it was. And, um, and it's hard to explain that, but it's like I got it at that point. And basically it's all of our connection with Baba, you know, it's just, it's all right there. Um, that was what I wanted, you know, that was, that was what I needed to understand, that none of that other stuff really mattered. It didn't matter whether I was even at the hospital, that we were all experiencing that at the same time. All of us, all over the country and all over the world, were experiencing this in our own ways. Um, this thing that Margaret was going through, and she knew it, you know, she knew it. Um, and I felt that every one of us was blessed through this experience, um, whatever that means, you know. <laughs> we were all, we were all part of it. And um, it, was, it was just really a gift to, go, to, to feel that, to, to get that. Um, she died at 818. And I was at home. <clears throat> I had been at home just trying to wrap things up. My apartment was bare. I'd been able, I, because of this move and because of my planned trip, I was able to do all this and be with Margaret. If it hadn't have been for that, I would have been working. My life would have been crazy. I couldn't have spent the time that I did in the hospital. But I had given my notice at work just a few days before she went into the hospital, I was through, and well, I hadn't given my notice. I'd given my notice weeks before, but I was through at work. And basically, everything was pretty much liquidated. Everything was done. So I had this blank space in my life that I could just devote to Margaret being in the hospital. And it, to me, it was such a miracle the way it all happened. Uh, because I just went with my own trust in what to do, that I was able to, to be there and have this unencumbered time, you know, to just go with it. So like I said, I was at home, and I got a call that she had just passed away. So I was in the, I lived like literally five minutes from the hospital. So I rushed over there, and there, there were a few people there, and... Um, I remember I walked in the room and I had an entry about that in here somewhere, if I can find it. Maybe I can't. But I walked in the room. The atmosphere was so thick in that room at that time that I, I, it was coming in waves when I walked in that door. And I really felt like I didn't know if I was going to be able to stand up or not. Um, it was really incredible. Here, here's the century. Margaret's gone. She passed on at 8.18 p.m. Denny called me 10 minutes later, and I rushed to the hospital. When I walked into her room, the atmosphere almost knocked me over. 
As I stood there, looking at her tiny white face, waves of Baba's presence passed through me. I moved to the foot of the hospital bed, and as I gazed at Margaret, tears streamed down my face. It felt good to cry. That's what I wrote. Um, there were, like I said, a handful of us who who just who were there, and we just stayed there. We just sat in the room for like half an hour, 45 minutes, or an hour. I don't even know how long it was. We just sat there, and each one of us was able to go up to her and you know to just have that little bit of time right then, and. Um, you know, she was just tiny and she was very peaceful and she looked really beautiful, very radiant. Um, here's something else I wrote. Um, I thought about how I continued to stay with her on Friday nights even though I was exhausted from working three jobs. I never questioned being with her, even though it was very hard, and I sometimes dreaded going to her house because the night shift was so grueling. But, but right now, I feel really happy, and I know that Baba has perfect timing. So mm -hmm. that's what I wrote. So we had a little. Um, um, program on the center. She didn't want any kind of a, a funeral or anything like that. So we just had a, like a get together, and we just told each one of us would tell stories. You know, a lot of us told stories <coughs> about Margaret, a little something. And um, then after that, I pretty much packed up everything and left. It was a few days later. Everything was done. I just loaded up my car, put the dogs in the car, and took off. And that was when I went to my grandmother's. I went straight to her house for Margaret's. And it was really interesting because when I left Myrtle Beach, it was on Baba's birthday. And I just had this feeling that that was when I needed to go. Even though part of me was saying, well, you should go to the center because they're having a get-together and, and a dinner and all that. No, you got to go today. So I, I did. And I was driving to my grandmother, so I was driving around Charlotte, North Carolina, to go up north towards Statesville to where she was. And I remember it was, uh, you know, I think it was dark, Baba's birthday. I turned the radio on, and there was like, I found this really nice station that was playing some new age music, and it sounded great. And, and um, I'm thinking about Baba's birthday and about the festivities and wondering if I did the right thing to leave on Baba's birthday, you know. Well, the song was over, and it happened to be a beautiful piece that a friend had given me on a tape right before I left. That was the piece that was playing on the radio. That was over. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like listening, and I heard uh, that piece was... Um, Donated. This time was donated by so and so on the occasion of Avatar Meher Baba's birthday, and I just went, "What?" <laughs> well, I looked at my clock. I glanced at the clock. It was 8:18, and I knew that everything was right. I was exactly where I needed to be, and just keep keep doing it. Whatever I was doing, <laughs> keep doing it. So that was kind of like the end of that chapter, and I I I knew that I I felt that I was bringing part of Margaret with me out here, and um, you know just felt really good about being able to do that because. Margaret is still very much with me all the time. Um, she helped me. She shaped my life in ways that I may never know, but just there was just 
something that she did, I, well, she pushed me to my limit constantly, which I really needed. You know, I think she helped to, to make me a little bit more patient, a little bit more tolerant, and I'm, I'm sure that Margaret knew what each one of us needed, and whatever it was, each one of us got that, everyone that worked with her. Um, the dancers referred to us as Margaret's last class, which was, <laughs> that, that was the nickname for us. And uh, she, she didn't let up on us any more than she did on her dancers, you know. It was, it was a constant thing. Um, does anybody have any questions right now about Margaret or, you know, anything that they'd like to know? Or, yeah. Did you know her previous to this, uh, you know, staying with her in these uh, vigils? I met her, like, once. I didn't really know her. And I, I remember I met her and she was, uh, you know, she was sitting on her porch and she was friendly, but, you know, I didn't feel like there was any big connection or anything like that. But it wasn't like this lady, I, I love this lady so much and I want to help her and serve. It wasn't like that at all. It was just something that I felt was a big opportunity and that, uh, I knew that if there was any way I could do it, I needed to do it. But I also felt that it would be the, probably the challenge of my life, which it pretty much was, you know. Because it's like the simplest little task of fixing toast with almond butter and honey becomes <coughs> something else. It, it, that's just the way it was. There, so many things were happening inside of me, it's just hard to explain. Um, why that ha why it was like that during that time why i felt us why something so simple would have pushed me to such a limit who knows um but from the stories that i hear that was the way it was when people worked with baba too it was always when they were at their at their limit entirely exhausted you know a hectic day at work or whatever and and they would just be pushed and pushed yeah well, I'm sure uh, grateful that you spoke here tonight. I uh, feel as a friend of Margaret's, as many of us are. And until you just told us about um, that you went to the room uh, that she didn't pass and you were at the uh, bottom of the bed, I really hadn't uh, mourned or cried uh, her passing. So I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to feel that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, Baba. Hey, Bob. Yes. Father had explained about him working with people at their limit that at that point they had less resistance from their ego because they were too tired. <laughs> I guess I guess that was it because there were times when I just couldn't I couldn't fight it anymore. I just had to you know. Um, and Margaret knew that. Margaret knew what the limit was. That was the thing about Margaret, and she pushed it. And I really believe that whatever le whatever level she was working on, I don't know, but she knew that. Just with a simple thing like opening the windows, you know, it just became such a such a, a major thing. Yeah. Well, one thing she I knew her as a friend, and uh, I also worked on the center. And with uh, when she would come down for visits, uh, she used to stay down there at Kitty's house or. House. Right. And I remember I came in and probably because I was being pushed or rushed to uh, do something either by Kitty or Elizabeth, who knows, or probably my own makeup actually, and uh, being conscientious, I uh, walked through the dining room door into the kitchen and there was Margaret uh, probably just getting ready at 10 o'clock in the morning to uh, finish having tea and uh, she was being pretty leisurely. And I probably said something to her. Hi, good morning, and I kept on walking, sort of like a automaton or whatever it was, <laughs> being beautiful. And uh, she looked at me, and she made a comment, oh, you're being beautiful. <laughs> beautiful? Beautiful. 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 Beauti
get with it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way she was, just a word or a phrase, and she'd stop you in your tracks. And uh, she did that with me. And some, I remember one night, this, this, is, this was a, a kind of a neat thing that happened. I'd been to New York on vacation for a week, and I came back, and I thought, oh, boy, this is going to be a rough night. You know, I just knew it. Um, and that particular night, I think she got up twice. It was the only night, you know, the whole time I was there that it, you just never knew it was going to happen. But something that I wrote about here that I, I thought about earlier that I wanted to talk about, let's see if I can find it. Um, there was one particular time that I remember when it was really, really difficult. She was up, I don't know, eight or ten times. I don't think I slept all night. And every, I'd go back in, in the other room and I'd lie down for maybe five minutes or ten minutes. And you just get to that point, you're starting to doze off, the bell would ring. So I'd go back. And it happened all night long. And I was just so pushed, you know, to my limit. And, but I, I just did my best to be cool, you know, not, to, <laughs> not to show that I was distressed or anything else like that. Just, just be as cool as I could be. But I remember the next morning just feeling like, oh, I don't know if I can do this again, you know. I don't know if I can come back. And um, the next week I came back, of course, and um, I just, did, something clicked in my head and I just decided, I'm going to do it different this week. I'm just going to, whatever Margaret wants, I'm just going to do it and I'll, I'll do more. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just made that decision. So she'd call me in there and I'd stay and I, I'd say, oh, Margaret, would you like me to read to you? Instead of, you know, trying to, like, get her settled down in bed and so I could, like, slip out the door. And, and I would, like, read until she was dropping off to sleep and then she would say, oh, you can stop now. I mean, I just, like, did everything. Um, we, she told me stories until she was dropping off, but she still wouldn't go to sleep, you know. She just would stay awake and stay awake. She was amazing. And um, then I remember at one point, uh, I was reading, I think I even read her favorite book, The Cure for, There is a Cure for Arthritis. This was her favorite book. <laughs> and uh, this was, <laughs> you gave her that book? <laughs> well, she used to make me read that book. And she actually She said, you know, she was always very homistic. Yes. Margaret never does so. Oh, yes. But she said, you know, a few hours ago, she was like that. But she said, there is a book there by a robot. And I said, there is a good process. So I shifted right Well, she used to have me come in at 3 in the morning and read chapters. <laughs> and, uh, and then if, if she liked what he said, like if it was something that he suggested that she thought she might want to do, like getting her legs massaged, she would have me check it or, or turn the corner down. But if it was something she didn't like, like changing her diet, she would tell me to cross out that page. <laughs> And she cracked me up. She was so funny, you know. Or, or if it was something that she was... That, that's what's so intelligent about her. She knew how to sit down the right thing. Well, <laughs> but if it meant exercise or anything like that that she didn't want to do. And she was supposed to do them, but this is another battle we had with her. But, cause, you know, she had like a little exercise in the morning where she was supposed to lift her arms and she got to where she just didn't want to do it. So anyway, that was really funny. Um, anyway, I even read that book to her that night, you know, like a chapter from her arthritis book. And um, finally she said to me, 
you need to go to bed. You must be exhausted. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no, Margaret. I'm going to stay. I'm here with you. I'm not leaving this room. She said, okay. And she kind of like laid back. And, and I just sat there. I was determined that I was going to stay up all night, you know, or whatever, whatever. I was just going to do it. And then she said, no, 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 you go to bed. I said, no, no, Margaret, I'm fine. I really am. And I was. You know, I was really into this. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm going to stay right here, right next to you. Because I felt like she was insecure at that time, and she didn't want to be alone. And uh, so she kind of laid back again, and then she said, no, you, you go to bed. I said, okay, Margaret. Oh. And I said, I just want you to know, and I was holding her hand, her tiny little hand, and I said, I just want you to know that I'm right on the other side of that wall, and I'm not leaving you. And if you need anything, all you have to do is whisper, and I'll be here. And she, you know, she really liked that. I think that she needed the security, and she just said, you're sweet. And she squeezed my hand, and I, you know, kissed her and left, and she slept all night. <laughs> and, uh... It, it was a good lesson for me. It was, you know, there were a lot of good lessons there. That, you know, who knows how long it would have taken me to learn those things without Margaret.